I want to invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 31. Genesis chapter 31. As we continue this teaching series titled Jacob, what we see in the book of Genesis is, is a story of brokenness and blessings. There's great brokenness after the fall of man leading up to chapter 31, and it will continue. <laughs> but there's great brokenness, but we cannot miss the blessings. Oftentimes, we find ourselves focused on the brokenness, and we miss the blessings of God. And so I pray today that as we look to Genesis chapter 31, and really this entire narrative, that we will be encouraged that we serve a God who is faithful, who is good, and continues to pour out his blessings day by day toward us, broken people. In chapter 27, we find that Jacob steals his brother Esau's blessing. He had already tricked his brother into stealing his birthright. We see in chapter 28 that Jacob, he flees. He flees and then he has this spiritual awakening, this encounter at ancient Luz. And after this dream and God speaking to him through this dream, he wakes up and he says these simple words. The Lord is in this place. He then makes his way to Padan Aram, which is northern, modern, modern northern Iraq. He meets up with Laban. He's tricked into marrying Leah. And then he marries Rachel. He worked seven years for both uh, each, so that's 14 years of working for them. Leah cannot have children, so she gives him his, uh, her maid servant, and, and then she then begins to have children, and then Rachel can't have children, and so she gives him her maid servant, and it's just a cluster of brokenness. But in the midst of the brokenness, we find blessing. We find blessings. All of that takes place in chapter 29. He then makes a deal with Laban that we're going to see today. He makes a deal with Laban, his father-in-law, for the castaway sheep. Hey, give me, give me the castaways, the ones that don't look good, the ones that have a spots and blemishes. You take the, the primo ones and give me these ones. And what does the Lord do? Even in the midst of Jacob and his brokenness, the Lord increases the flock and he multiplies the, the flock. And as a result, Jacob becomes very rich. All that we read in chapter, chapter 30. Look at chapter 30, verse 25, before we go to 31. After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, send me on my way so that I can return to my homeland. He's ready to go home. He's homesick. He, he was never supposed to be in this land for 20 years, 14 for the women and, 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 and six for uh, the flock. He was never supposed to be, but he's homesick. He asked Laban to return him. And look at verse 27. But Laban said to him, if I have found favor with you, stay. I have learned by uh, divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Do you hear these words? I wonder if this can be said of you and I. Can others say that they are blessed because of you? Can others say that they are blessed because of me? Laban tells him this. Hey, hey hold on. I really don't want you going anywhere. <laughs> and so what we see so far and what we will continue to see is this out of the worst family situation. I mean, it doesn't get more dysfunctional than this family right here. Okay. Okay. Out of the worst family situation came the best blessing, a savior. Out of the worst family situation, conflict, I mean, 
deception. You, you think what's one thing that couldn't happen? It, it has happened within this family. Out of the worst family situation came the best blessing, a Savior. We read that in Matthew chapter 1, the clear lineage of our Savior Jesus, born from this family line, born out of the brokenness to be our greatest blessing. Look at verse 1, chapter 31. Now Jacob heard what Laban's sons were saying. Jacob has taken all that was our father's and has built this wealth in what belonged to our father. And Jacob saw from Laban's face that his attitude toward him was not the same as before. You ever, you ever met that person? Uh, man, one day, it's good. We're good. You're good. It's all good. And then the next day, whoa, I don't know what happened, uh, but something, something has gone awry, right? Their, their face, man, they were excited to see us. Now they just want to kill me. <laughs> you know, uh, you, you, you ever found yourself in this, in this particular place? Uh, but because of the increase in the flock, because the Lord has blessed Jacob and his flock, now the sons are distorting the truth. Listen, envy, envy will distort the truth. Envy will distort the truth. You make sure that you continue to be the person of character, uh, the man or woman of in integrity, the, the one who is walking in truth, who knows the truth so that you are set free. Allow the others to talk. Allow the others to do whatever they're going to do. Be encouraged today that there is one who is your defender, and it is the Lord our God. He's the rock on which we stand. Laban's body language elevated, tension between he and Jacob. Of course, 20 years, as I already stated, 20 years of tension reached, finally reached the, reached the peak. Jacob's success has gotten to Laban and his sons. But notice this, out of tension came a new trajectory. 20 years of built up tension, 20 years of lies, 20 years of deception, 20 years of labor, built all kinds of tension. But out of this tension comes a new trajectory where Jacob finally hears from the Lord to go back home. There is a new path out of this tension. I, I don't know where you find yourself today. I don't know the painful moments of life that you might be experiencing today. Brokenness, vision, all of these things. Perhaps the Lord is preparing you for a new path. The question today is, will you have faith and trust him? Will you not just listen, but will you obey? Verse 3, the Lord said to him, go back to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. This is, this is a simple word. The Lord says, go back home, and I will be with you. Go back home, and I will be, I will be with you. Faith is doing what God says to do, despite the mountains of obstacles before us. Oftentimes, we are so focused on the mountain of obstacles before us, and we allow those mountains of obstacles to distract us, to discourage us. So we find ourselves in a disobedient place. But what is it that God is calling you to? And will you walk in faith? Will you trust him that he will be present? Look at verse 4. Jacob, Jacob had Rachel and Leah called to the field where his flocks were. He said to them, I can see from your father's face that his attitude toward me is not the same as before, but the God of my father has been with me. Do you, do you see that? Do you hear it? God of my father has been with me. You know that with all my strength, I have served your father and that he has cheated me and changed my wages 10 times, but God has not let him harm me. 
If he said the spotted sheep will be your wages, then all the sheep were born spotted. If he said the streaked sheep will be your wages, then all the sheep were born streaked. God has taken away your father's herds and given them to me. When the flocks were breeding, I saw in a dream that the streaked, spotted, and speckled males were mating with the females. In that dream, the angel of God said to me, Jacob. And I said, here I am. He said, look up and see. All the males that are mating with the flocks are streaked, spotted, and speckled. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. Do you hear that? This is the Lord. God speaking in a way that only he can speak. I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel. Not that, not that he needed this reminder even. I am the God of Bethel where you poured oil on the stone marker and made a solemn vow to me. Get up, leave this land and return to your native land. Then Rachel and Leah answered him. Do we have any portion or inheritance in our father's family? Are we not regarded by him as outsiders? For he has sold us and has certainly spent our purchase price. Verse 16, in fact, all the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. So do, listen to this, do whatever God has said to you. This is what Leah and Rachel say. Do whatever God has said to you. A couple interesting notes. Verse 4, Jacob, he calls Leah and Rachel. He shares the situation. He consults with them on this situation. Uh, husbands, I would say to you today, it is wise to consult with your wife. Husbands, write it down. It is wise, it is always a wise thing to do to consult your wife. Then, then look all the way to verse 16. Do whatever God has said to you. I would then say from the text, wives should submit to their husbands. Now hold on before we get too excited. Husbands, husbands should give their wives a godly reason to submit to them. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22 says this. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. The scripture is very clear. Wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord. Then look at verse 25. Verse 25 of Ephesians 5. Husbands, Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. We we have a a beautiful example of what a biblical marriage looks like, where there is submission and sacrificial love. However, when one is not happening, it's it's a broken cycle. I recall a time where I met with a couple We met at a local coffee shop, probably not the wisest place to meet with a couple going through some marital issues, (laughs) but I have learned since learned. (laughs) I met with them. I knew what was going on, and the husband opens up our meeting with slamming his hand on the table and saying, Pastor Tim, tell my wife to submit to me. I said, "Woo." Get another coffee over here. <laughs> no. I said, uh, his name. I said, before I tell your wife to submit to you, I must tell you that there is no evidence of sacrificial love within you. Why should she submit to you when you're not loving her like Christ loved? Sadly, you probably guessed it. The marriage didn't make it. With an attitude so abrupt like that. But husband and wives, listen. Husbands, consult your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. 
Husbands, love your, love your bride sacrificially. Serve her well. Serve her well. And allow God, allow God to be the center and foundation of your marriage. And then your marriage should be an example to others. Let's look to verse 17. That was a side note that was completely free, uh, fellas, there for you and wives. Verse 17, so Jacob got up, put his children and wives on the camels. He took all the livestock and possessions he had acquired in Padan Aram, and he drove his herd to go to the land of Canaan, to his father, Isaac. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household idols. And Jacob deceived Laban, the Aramean, not telling him that he was fleeing. He fled with all his possessions, crossed the Euphrates, and headed for the hill country of Gilead. So Jacob packs everything up, packs it up rather quickly, doesn't tell anyone, and they move on. Verse 19, we see that Rachel steals some of the household idols. In, in, in Hebrew, the word here is teraphim. It's teraphim. Now, some believed that, that, that these household idols, uh, that ancestors or deities or spirits lived within them and consulted them. And so what we know that these household idols that Rachel steals are, in fact, a pagan worship, not to, not to make this journey back to Canaan, the land of promise. But nevertheless, she, she steals. Now, many scholars believe that she probably took these idols to have some kind of legal right to the property. They had just asked the question, do we have any inheritance left? Is there anything? Has he taken it all? Has he spent all the money? And so Jacob flees. He doesn't tell Laban. And he leaves the same way, if you remember, the same way that he left home originally. He just goes. I would say, as we look at this particular section of the scriptures, that in no way, shape, or form is God glorified through deception. In no way, shape, or form is God glorified through stealing. This is not the way of Christ. This is not the way of the church. This is not the way of one who is wholly surrendered to the living God. There should be a distinct different about, difference about us. We should be men and women of character and integrity. And the purpose of our lives, may I remind you, church, is to bring glory to God. That a lost world should see something different about us. That no, I will not steal this. Or no, I will be a, a, a man or woman who honors uh, 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 my word, who, who my yes is my yes, and my no is my, my, my no. What we've seen thus far, chapter 31, is a heavenly confirmation. That is God saying, hey, it's time to go. It, it, and next, what we see is an earthly confrontation. You, you, you guess, you might guess how the story is going to go once Laban finds out. Look at verse 22. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he took his relatives with him, pursued Jacob for seven days, and overtook him in the hill country of Gilead. But God, notice this, don't, don't miss this, but God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream at night. And this is what God says to him. Watch yourself. God warned him. Don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. God comes to Laban in the stream. God has promised his protection. And the God we serve keeps his promises. Laban is no doubt in my mind coming to kill. He's seeking some revenge. How do you uproot my family, how have you stolen from me now all this wealth, and you're not even going to say goodbye? 
And I love how God interrupted his intentions through this dream. Next, we see Laban confronts. He confronts Jacob. Look at verse 26. Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? You have deceived me and taken my daughters away like prisoners of war. Why did you secretly flee from me, deceive me, and not tell me? I would have sent you away with joy and singing with tambourines and lyres. He's probably lying, but we just continue to read verse 28. But you didn't even kiss my grandchildren or let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters. You have acted foolishly. Verse 29, I could do you great harm, but notice that, but last night, the God of your father said to me, watch yourself. Don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you have gone off because you long for your father's family, verse 30. But why have you stolen my God? So there's this confrontation. There's this conflict in the hills of Gilead, the countryside of Gilead. And I, I want to, I want to just encourage us to two responses to conflict. Because we're either in the middle of a conflict having just walked out of a conflict, or we're walking into one. We find ourselves in either three. We live in a conflict-driven world. So how, do, how should we handle conflict? Well, Jacob didn't have much of a choice. I mean, the conflict, I mean, Laban brought the conflict to him. <laughs> and perhaps somebody's brought the conflict to you. Or this week, somebody's going to bring the conflict to you. The first, would you write this down? We must handle conflict Quickly, quickly. We must handle conflict quickly. We can't hope that the issue is going to resolve itself. I know many of people that just hope it's going to disappear, hope it's going to fade away, hope the person's going to forget about it. But listen, now that the issue just doesn't resolve itself. My friend Craig Colbert says, Hope is a great attitude, but a terrible strategy. Hope is a great attitude, but it's a terrible strategy. How do we handle Conflict, we should handle it quickly. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he reminds them, he instructs them in Ephesus, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Listen, he says this, but speaking the truth in love, speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head Christ. So how do we handle the conflict quickly? First, in love. Make sure that you are filled with the love of God as you're handling whatever conflict you might find yourself in. Uh, then we see Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Why is that? Because anger builds. It grows. It tears you apart. And so don't go. No, handle that quickly. Handle whatever that conflict. Handle it quickly. And then verse 27. Don't give the devil an opportunity. He doesn't need any more room. Right? He's on the prowl, seeking whom he may devour. And so can I just encourage you today, church, how do we handle conflict? Quickly. Secondly, how do we handle conflict? Biblically. Biblically. Reconciliation. Listen, listen closely. Reconciliation is the goal. Reconciliation should be the goal for the believer. Why? Because we've been reconciled. I mean, if, if God sought after me and my pitiful state, my wretched state, my sinful state, loved me enough that he went to a cross to cover all my sins. He didn't just do it for me, but for the world, for all humanity. Reconciliation is always the goal for the believer. Look at verse 20 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20. Therefore, the context is we have this ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. Do you hear this, church? Do you see this? You and I, not just the pastor, not just the pastors, but the church together, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal for us. I, I don't know what that does inside of you, but that, that, that should spark some hope and some excitement that God wants to use his church to make his appeal to a lost and broken world. 
People that are on the trajectory to hell, he wants to scoop them up, rescue them, save them. And he's called us as the church. Plead this. Be reconciled. Christ. So how do we handle conflict quickly, biblically? Reconciliation is always the goal. Look back to verse 20, 29. I could do you a great harm. Laban says, but last night, the God of your father said to me, watch yourself. Don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Once again, God had promised to protect Jacob in spite of Jacob, right? You remember that chapter 28? What does God promise? Three promises in chapter 28. He promises his protection. He promises his provision. He promises his, his presence. And despite of Jacob, God keeps his promise. Like, despite me and you and our shortcomings, God keeps his promises. Verse 31, we find that even knowing that God was, was clear, I will be with you. God was clear to Jacob, I will be with you. Knowing this, what do we find in verse 31? Jacob was afraid. You see that? Jacob was afraid. Jacob answered, I was afraid, for I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. I was, a, I was afraid. I was afraid. Listen, fear will keep you from fulfilling God's call on your life. Fear will keep you. It will hinder you. It will hinder you. Over 87 times in the Bible, we find these words, fear not. Within the context of trust me, don't be afraid. Fear not. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. What does the Lord tell Abram? He, tell Ab he tells Abram, don't be afraid. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. You hear that? Isaiah chapter 41. The Lord speaks through the prophet Isaiah to the children of Israel. What does he, what does he tell them? Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. You fast forward to, fast forward to the New Testament, Luke chapter 8. When Jesus heard it, he answered, don't be afraid. Only believe she will be safe. Don't be afraid. Hebrews 13, 6. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Listen, the cure for fear has always been, it will always be faith. You move in faith. When the Lord instructs you, 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 you follow through in faith. You hold on. You don't give up. You keep your eyes focused on him. You keep marching forward in faith. No matter the mountains that are before you, no matter the people that are coming after you, you hold on in faith. Not only was Jacob afraid, but we see he was angry. He was angry. You see that in verse 36. Then Jacob became, became incensed, became angry, brought charges against Laban. Why is this? Because Rachel had stolen these, these, these idols. She was hiding them. She was hiding these idols. They searched all the tents. They couldn't find them. And so then Jacob gets ticked off, and he's angry. He's angry at Laban. Shirah is the Hebrew word for incensed or angry. It's to glow or to burn. Out of the worst family situation came the greatest blessing a savior. Here's a man who's heard from the Lord, but yet he's still afraid. Here's a man who's heard from the Lord, yet he turns angry. And after all, this is said and done. An agreement is reached between Jacob and Laban. As we close today, I want to encourage us that God knows everything. 
and leave it to him. Well, whatever you're holding on to, whatever you're struggling, wrestling with, whatever it is, God knows everything. Leave it to him. Hebrews 4, 13 says, no creature, cre uh, creature is hidden. No creature is hidden from him. But all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. No one, no thing can hide from the eyes of God. He's bigger. He's sovereign over all things. He's in all things. And he's working out all things. And so the question today is, will I have faith? He will come through. Will I trust him in the hardest moments of life? Will I trust him in this conflict? Will I trust him in the brokenness? Will I see that he, that there are blessings available in the midst of it all? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? Would you just simply ask the Lord, what is my response from all of this? It's a simple question that we ask each week. What is my response? God, you want me to do with this? As people are asking that question throughout the house and online, Maybe there's someone here that's never surrendered their life over to Jesus and today will be the day of salvation for you. Maybe you walked into this worship gathering, you joined us online to this worship gathering and you felt yourself lost, hopeless. And today is the day that you surrender everything over to Jesus. He takes hold. He forgives you of all your past, present, and future. He gives you a living hope and a hope beyond this earth. As people are praying all over this place, if that's you, today is the day of salvation for you. Would you say something like this to the Lord, not to me, to, to the Lord? Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. You are the Savior. Forgive me of all my sins. I believe in you. You walked this earth, died on a cross, replaced in a grave, and you rose victorious. You are alive today. So today I place all my hope, trust in you. Thank you for saving me. That's your prayer. Would you just thank him right where you're at? In just a moment as we sing this final song, there's going to be men and women at the different corners of this building. There's a host online for those that are worshiping online with us. And we would love to pray with you. Maybe you're going through just a tough time right now and it's something special just for someone to pray with you. So there's going to be men and women at each corner. There's a host online that when we start singing, would you take a step out of your seat? And would you come to one of these corners? And would you say, would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Maybe you gave your life to Christ today. You surrendered your life over to Jesus. And the first step would be to tell somebody, tell somebody. So when we start singing, would you step out of your seat? And would you move to one of these corners? Or would you let us know in the chat? Today, I surrendered my life over to Jesus. We want to celebrate with you. And we want to pray for you. Maybe you're wondering what your next step is. Looking for some direction. Would you have the courage when we start singing this? Step out of that seat. Come to one of these corners. Let us know in the chat. Would you stand to your feet? As we sing these words, these simple words, would you move as the Spirit of God leads you to move today? Take your next step. What is your, what is your next step today?